baptism is. Baptism is done for the forgiveness of sins, Acts 2.38. Baptism is done to save us, 1 Peter 3.21, Acts 2.40, Mark 16.16. 16. Baptism is done to wash away our sins, Acts 22.16. Baptism is done to be reborn to new life, John 3.5, Romans 6, 3 through 6. Baptism is done to clothe ourselves with Christ, Galatians 3, 26 and 27. Trust in the Lord with all your hearts, and lean not into your own understanding. In all your ways acknowledge Him, and He shall direct your path. Amen. Thank you, Brother Cantrell. This, this has been a tremendous youth conference. Brother Foster's preaching has been instructive, anointed, we can understand it, and it has the Holy Ghost mixed in it. Don't lose, don't lose the thrill of the apostolic Holy Ghost preaching. Never lose that. We don't want to go back to dead, dull, boring type of lectures. We want something living, kicking, moving, doing something. <laughs> I want to make an announcement here. Uh, the little snack bar out there, someone gave them a traveler's check and forgot to sign it. And I'm not sure if I got the name right. I think they said Judy Crawford or something like that. But if you didn't sign the back of that, whoever it might have been, go back and sign it. That'll help them out a lot. And all of the pledges was made last night. I forgot to mention it to you. Uh, if you don't put it in the offering here, send it to the district office at Hanford. You will get credit for it, and also uh, we'd like to have it as soon as possible. So please keep it in mind. Don't forget us after you leave here. Thank you again for all that good response they gave us last night. That was tremendous. I appreciate our pastors. They have the burden of the work of God at heart, and they're not afraid to back it up and support it. And I think the youth of our district is more valuable to us than money. Uh, they have a value that you can't pay for, you can't buy. I can't help but say that good young people is not just the result of good parents. It's because you've got some good young people. Amen. They have something to do about that, too. And I think when young people live for God, that was their choice. And I want you to know I appreciate you living for God. And I like to have every, every child in that home living for the Lord. But if you have brothers and sisters that are not serving God, you are the key. Young people... Be a living example to your family. And then I'd like just to introduce this thought to you. I may get on to it a little later. I'm not sure. But please, young people, don't forget. You have a nature that you're born with, that you're going to deal with. And the sooner you get at it, the better it's going to be for you. When you get angry and say things to your parents and to your brothers and sisters, that, that's not right. Uh, that's, that grieves the Holy Ghost. You can't let your nature just get the best of you. And please understand this. You'll regret every bad word you ever said to your mom and dad. Don't, don't let your temptation get to the place you rebel and show an attitude against your mom and dad. You're sinning against your own soul. And you have God against you. Now, the reason I'm emphasizing that, we're having a lot of rebellion today in the world. And we don't need to have it in the church. And I know you've got a nature to deal with. Uh, and I know you can control it if you had to. It's just that you think you get away with it. If mom and dad's kind of been real easy for you, don't take advantage of that. You don't try to push the borders back to where they've they got to put a fence up in the barbed wire electric fence to keep you in. You ought to be trustworthy, dependable, obedient, and submissive, and say, May I? May I? Don't come in and tell them where you're going. Ask them, can you go? Well, hallelujah. You'll have the better chance to enjoy the service if you live right at home. It's your house where it begins. Now, we use a scripture sometimes, and I don't know whether you realize what it says or not, but it says, judgment begins at the house of God. Now, we all like to think that means when I come to God, that's when he starts putting the record on me. It means more than that. If God doesn't judge His church first, He can't judge the world. Now understand that. 
that prophet he preached about the other night that went back and had dinner with the, the old false prophet, it was that young prophet that died. The old man lived on. You say, how unfair. No, it isn't. God judges his own first for disobedience, and he'll get around the old prophet. He may be in hell right now. But I'm trying to explain something to you. God's going to judge you whether you realize that the other person or the outsider gets judged or not. He will take care of that. But sometimes in the church, you think, I'm getting picked on. You better get picked on here than go to hell. <laughs> and you've got to understand the value of correction. Now, real preaching has to have some rebuke in it, some instructions in it, some reproving in it, and some long-suffering in it, and some doctrine to be preaching. Now, if it doesn't have some of those things in there, you're just talking. But preaching has something to do with us, and it deals with us. And so, when I think of you young people, I've counted it one of my highlights to be able to talk to you on these days in youth camp. And I like to see you have a good time. I like to see these boys and girls get acquainted with each other. But I'd like you to always remember, respect your own body. Keep it godly. Every one of us are here to, to help you. And you are our pride and joy. I don't know how to tell you any further than just express to you to see you succeed in life and see you blessed in life and see you get the right husband and the right wife and see you be in the church fulfilling the will of God. That's a thrill of your parents, of your pastor, and of God. And we want that to happen to you. Praise the Lord. We all? I, I thought I'd better get that done first. But if you stand with me now and look at Psalms 127. Psalms 127. Except the Lord build the house, they labor in vain that build it. Except the Lord keep the city, the watchman wake it but in vain. Now, would you repeat it after me this time? Except the Lord build a house, they labor in vain. I'd like you to keep that in mind. Except the Lord build a house, your labor is in vain. Now, if you don't mind, let's kick it over in the New Testament. And let's go to the book of Matthew and the seventh chapter. And you'll notice in the twentieth verse, Jesus is finishing the Sermon on the Mount. And, and he's talking about... A building here. And he first mentioned, he said that uh, not everyone that says, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven. But he that doeth, which means continually, the will of my Father which is in heaven. Now many will say in that day, Lord, Lord, I went to youth conference. I shouted. I worshipped. I ran the aisles. That does not count and take away from the fact that he's more interested in your relationship with him than what you're doing. Now, let me explain it so you don't misunderstand it. Our shouting, running the aisles, clapping our hands is our expression to the Lord how we feel. And you don't want to ever lose the Pentecostal joy and the Pentecostal thrill of expressing it to the Lord. It may be one way, various manifestations, but don't let that be the thermometer that tells you how spiritual you are. Your spirituality is going to be tested when you leave the house and meet somebody else. So when I explain this to you, I'm going to pass on that point, but I wanted you to know that the Lord is more interested in building something in you than what you can do. So I don't care how big your talents or how small or whatever, that is not the important thing with Him. He likes to know you and Him have it together. That you know Him, that you love Him, and that you're learning about Him. And if you expect that to be a progressiveness, don't forget, He's the greatest teacher the world's ever heard. He said, I'll walk in you and I'll talk in you. Young people, you are the 
you are the, the apple of his eye. Many young people in the Bible, in Pentecost, in our churches today, many young people have heard from God, personally heard from God. And I feel if we can teach you how to hear the voice of God, listen to the voice of God, you will be blessed all your life. So I wanted to explain, when we talk about building now, the building in what we're going to be looking at in the Scripture is a house that God builds. And notice he said there's, there was a... Uh, he finished his discourse, and he said, Therefore, whosoever heareth these sayings of mine, and doeth them, I will liken him unto a wise man, which built his house upon a rock. The rains descended, floods came, winds blew, beat upon the house, and it fell not, because God built it. Because God built it. Anything he doesn't build goes away. He washes it out. The storm will, will beat on it. Now, if you notice the next one... That this fellow was not wise. He built upon the sand, and the same winds that blew for the house that stood blew on this house, and great was the fall thereof. And, but here in the 26th verse, everyone that heareth these sayings of mine and doeth them not. Now you heard, but you didn't take action. You're like a foolish man. Your house is on sand, and the same winds that blow upon one will blow upon another, but one has an anchor in a foundation that won't go away. If you so easy to blow away, you didn't get on the anchor of the foundation, and you were building on your own foundation, and your own foundation is sand. It's weak. Now, I'd like to go to a scripture that's found in the book of Luke. We'll get these out of the way, and you can listen to me comment on them later. The 16th verse of the 12th chapter of Luke, I believe. And he talks about a, a rich man. His ground... Uh, this rich man had ground that produced plentifully, which means more than enough. He thought within himself. Now notice, his thinking was within himself. What shall I do? Because I have no room where to bestow my fruit. And he said, this will I do. I will pull down my barns and build greater. And there will be, there will I bestow all my fruits and my goods in a barn. And I will say to my soul, soul, thou hast much goods laid up for many years. Take thy knees, eat, drink, and be merry. But God said unto him, thou fool, this night is thy soul required of thee. Then who shall these things be? which thou hast provided. So is he that layeth up treasures for himself and is not rich toward God. Are you building a house or are you building a barn? Third chapter of Revelations, I'm going to give you a church that didn't build a church, they built a barn. And under the angel of the church of Laodicea to write, these things saith the Amen, the faithful, the true witness, the beginning of creation of God. I know thy works, that thou art neither hot nor cold, and I would that thou wert cold or hot. So then, because thou art lukewarm, and neither cold nor hot, I will spew thee out of my mouth. Because thou sayest, I am rich, I am increased with goods, I have need of nothing, and knowest not thou... Thou art wretched, miserable, poor, blind, and naked. I counsel thee to buy of me gold tried in the fire, that thou mayest be rich. That's true riches. White raiment, that thou mayest be clothed, and that thy shame of thy nakedness do not appear. And not thine eyes of thy salve, that thou mayest see. As many as I love, I rebuke, chasten. Now be zealous, therefore, and repent. Behold, I... Jesus standing at the door and knock. If any man, not just the, the whole church, but if any man hear my voice and open the door, I will come into him and will sup with him and he with me. To him that overcometh will I grant to sit with, uh, with me in my throne, even as I have overcome and sit down in my Father's throne. Now notice, he that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. Thank you, Father, for your word. In Jesus' name. Amen. And you may be seated. 
Are you building a barn? Are you building a, a house? Or, if the Lord is the builder of your house, He's the best builder I know of. Before there was a world and a star that ever blinked and before the sun and moon was ever created, in the inner sanctum of the Almighty God, somewhere in the ages beyond our timing, He stood by Himself and counseled with Himself that He would have a church in a world that was filled with violence and wickedness and sinfulness, and the devil has free course of the, being the God of the air, but I still will have a church, a glorious church, without spot or wrinkle or any such thing. That was God's mind before the world ever came about. He told Peter, upon this rock I will build my church. He's a builder, friend. He's a, he's a builder from the time beyond our knowledge. He's noted as a builder. He built so many things. He came here as a carpenter. It says he still is a builder. But if you go back and see in the times when Lucifer was in his prime and when iniquity was found in his heart, you hear the same words, I will ascend, I will be like, I will, I will, I will. Your will is what God has to conquer. Until he has your will, you have no place in the kingdom of God. God doesn't take your little tips. He doesn't take your little gestures of how do you do's. He wants to dwell in the house that he builds. And so when you look at the creation, it seems as though to me that there was a time perhaps on this earth and the millenniums of years behind us, I don't know how many you could stack up there. It doesn't matter to me how many bones they find, how many skulls they dig up. But I tell you what, the God that created the heavens and the earth, I believe whatever he did was right. And this earth, I think, was perhaps the domain of the devil. Satan had his run here. This was his throne. He evidently had a lot of, a lot of interest in this world. And it seems like that when he rose up against God, that he began to build an ego inside of him and had an attitude inside of him that he wanted to be bigger than higher than God. That's in all human nature right now, is to supersede, to be better than, to be the best, to be the greatest. That's something inside of human nature presents competition, strife and wrath, wrath and wars and so on. That's in the human nature. It comes from Satan himself. And he fell in the midst of a heaven where there was no sin. Everything was beautiful. But, but when he fell, you notice that the Lord put him out. And the reason he did, is, I believe it was, if you want to be God, and if you think you are a God, I'm going to let you create your world for you to live in. You're going to build your own house. And so he pulled the lights out, turned the world upside down, dumped everything out, changed everything around, and left gross darkness hanging out here in the middle of nowhere. How many ages of time that went by, I don't know. But I can imagine the Lord's voice could penetrate the darkness ever so often. said, Lucifer, how's things going down there? And I believe he could reach out in the darkness and say, I can't see, there's no lights. If you're a God, you ought to be able to turn on some lights. If you're a God, you ought to make a world. You ought to have power to create. You're so great, you want to be God? Go ahead, be God on the earth. If you can make a world come about, if you can make things come about, I'll let you have the world and you'll be a God of the world. And lights and darkness stayed with us until the day that the Holy Spirit moved upon the face of the deep. And God, be God began to create a new heaven and a new earth, wherein we see the animals, the trees, the, the vegetation, and we see finally man coming into being. It was all made that man could live under this, in this circumstance. God built him a world. He built him a garden, which was a special place that he'd meet and have fellowship together with Adam. You know, it's always remembered that God has to have a place somewhere in your world. He must possess the best part of you, and that's the whole house. And so the whole world was his. But he gave it to Adam and said, just enjoy all you want. But I'll meet you in the garden. There'll be a little place that I marked off as a garden, and we'll meet there. And he met with Adam. And I see that God wanted a relationship. 
All the extras that was given was not to be your focal point of getting these things. You already have them. You want to desire me above everything that you have around you. You must hunger and thirst after righteousness and you'll be filled with Christ. Then you can enjoy the world that He's made. You won't misuse it, but you'll find pleasure in living even on this earth. And of course, as you see the story unfold, when they failed and he was put out of the garden, God had to start another program of building project. And he noticed that he found a man named Noah and he built an ark. And that ark was made of a certain type of wood, the rains that was going to come and so on. But you see, God built a habitation for a remnant of people upon the earth that he could close them in with him. He locked them in that ark until the rains and water subsided. That ark was salvation to those people in the ark. And I want you to recognize that it was God building that ark. You see, we say a contractor built this building. He might not have done anything particularly himself, but he was in charge of it. He had the responsibility. Many worked on this building. Well, God's building that he's building in the ark was made for the animals and for the rescuing of his remnant to be go over to the next dispensation. God told Noah how to do it. He got some help and they built the ark and there it was. But lo and behold, man failed again. And God chose a nation, I mean, told a family at that time, I'll choose to build a family. Maybe I can get into a house and a home somewhere. I've got to build a sanctuary where I can have free access to mankind on the earth. I don't want to be shut out. And so he started out with Adam, I mean, with Abraham. And Abraham went on until it seems like things began to develop. And, and even that began to have a fault and a failure. And they gave him a Moses. And, and then God said, I need a tabernacle to meet in. So he built a tabernacle. You see, God's a builder. He'll always build his house. He's not going to build your house. He's going to build his house. And so when he built the tabernacle, there was a meeting place. He built the temple. It was a meeting place. That was God's house. Everything that God makes is made for him to come and enjoy with you. You don't need to live for God like it's a chore, like it's a tongue kind of a, a burden on your back. It ought to be a thrill when He comes walking into your life and in the morning hours, the daytime. He's walking, He's talking, He's revealing Himself to me. I'm learning more about Jesus Christ than I am about the people around me because He's ever lovely. And so the meeting place He had at that time did not suffice. And then He said, I prepared me a body. And that body was born in Bethlehem. Little peasant girl, they say she's a teenager, wrapped that bundle of divinity in her arms. Look at that baby's eyes, not really knowing, but those eyes are going to see sorrow and they're going to weep. Those little dimpled hands that you're holding in your hand, they're going to be pierced one day. Those little chubby feet are going to have a nail driven in them. What's happening? God's preparing him a body. In order to have a body, he's got to have a body that has not been marred by sin. Mary gave him the body, but God gave the blood. And it's in the blood where there's no sin. Pure blood. And God built a house in this son. Mary's baby was rocked and cradled in a barn. He came to a barn first because the world had lost the ability to build him a house. No meeting place. No place to fellowship with my creation. And so he built himself a body. And that body began to teach and preach. He was crucified on Calvary, received back up into glory. And then he said, now I'm going to build me a church. He sent the Holy Spirit back to this, this body of people that got it started. I'm going to build a church that's going to be a glorious church. I'm going to build me a church that the world cannot penetrate it. The devil can't touch it. I've got young people to live for God in spite of hell all around them. They have a touch of the power of the glory of God. I'm going to prove the devil that I can get young people to live for me when you couldn't live for me in heaven. They're living for me in, my, in all the, the dirt and grime around them. They're serving the Lord. That baby was born in a barn. But I want you to know it came to the lowest level, the lowest elements of life to raise all of us that, were, that we were raised in barns too. In fact, all we were was a barn full of junk. Yes, he made him a body. 
Don't you know that in my mind's eye, and I understand this, I would have loved to have been in one of his classes. I would have loved to have been there when he rose and went back into heaven. The impact that made upon those people, Peter said, I was an eyewitness. I was an eyewitness. But I can't go back to there. But now I've been born again and, and now I've been changed. He's building a house inside of me. It's called a temple for the Holy Ghost to live inside of here. And oh, when you repent of your sins and you're baptized in His name, now that blood will blot out all your past sins and put them all under the blood of Jesus Christ. And I want you to know they'll never be brought against you in this world or the world to come. They're under the blood of Jesus. I was baptized. They're under the blood. And now He said, I'm going to walk in them. I'm going to talk in them. And they're going to be my house. Well, praise the Lord. Let's love Him for it. You know, when I think of being the Holy Ghost coming into our life, that's the greatest miracle that's ever happened, is the Holy Ghost coming into your life. But let's look a little bit. He wants to live in us and possess our house. This is His house. You know, I noticed that it's the ladies that decorate the houses. If men had to live by themselves. Hey, they'll be in a barn. They haven't got no decorative ideas. If I make the bed, I'll be back in it tonight. Why wash the dishes every time you eat? I'll let them stack. It's amazing how much junk we can live in when we're lazy. Don't want to do anything. But you put a woman in the house. If you're going to rent a house, they want the feel of that house. I, 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 I can live here. I mean, but look, the walls are red, I know, but we'll paint them. And the, the, the doors, they're pink. We can paint that. The rug's dirty. We'll clean that. And when she's in there for about a week or two, her personality is in that house. Pictures is on the walls. The rugs are clean. Repainted all that junky color. And you walk into the house and you say, uh, this is my house. No, it's my wife's house. The house tells more about the woman than does the man. In fact, you women would rather a man to come to your house than a woman. You know, the woman's looking at things. Man don't see nothing. It's strange how that a man doesn't feel as close to those four walls as she does. He hangs pictures on the wall that's her likings, colors that are her liking. That reflects her interest in her home. Now, do you think the Lord's going to move in on a dump and try to push the trash around and go to bed in, a, uh, in covers that's been full of vomit? No. And when he started looking for a house to move into, he come by your door and he said, it's empty and it needs something here. And the Lord looks inside, but I can't come in that kind of house. I've got to give you a GI scrubbing, give you a new inside, fix the outside, until the world won't even recognize who you were. Because when I come in, I'm going to clean the house. I'm going to clean this house. And when I get through... When I get through cleaning this house, it's going to reflect my personality. It's going to reflect my nature. It's going to express my desires. It's going to express everything that I love. Because this is my house now. You're His house. It belongs to Him. You don't belong to yourself. When He moves in, He wants to redecorate that house. He wants to change the curtains. He's going to change the, 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 the covers. He's going to throw them on the junk pile. He's going to bring in brand new everything. You're going to be a new creature, baptized, filled with the Holy Ghost. That's my Jesus. Hallelujah. We've got to get our eyes on Him. It's His house. Your body is a temple of the Holy Ghost. Your body is a temple of the Holy Ghost. He only loans it to you. 
You don't own it. There's going to come a day he's going to knock on your door and say, The rent's up. i got a new renter coming. You're out. It's my house. You see, Jesus said that the house that I'm going to build will have a foundation. Deep. And there's a foundation that's been laid that no other man can lay but what's already been laid. That's Jesus Christ. That's why I believe that we're living in a day, and I hope you young people can catch this. If you get your eyes on Jesus Christ and start learning how to walk with God, how to fellowship with Him alone, you don't grow in a conference. You grow in the night. That's why your cotton crops out here have to have hot nights. It's at the night that they grow the most. I want you to know as a child of God, it may seem like you're going through a dark place. But don't forget this. He is a light in the darkest place you could go through. He is the beauty of that house. You'll see the reflection of His favor. It's He that will comfort you. It's He that will strengthen you. It's He that will make you feel you're worth something. It's He that will make your house a home. There's a many a house that's not a home. But oh, He wants to dwell in you. That means be comfortable living inside of you. If you read about Martha, the Bible said it was Martha's house. I don't care if Lazarus was there. Miss Martha ruled that house. I mean, she was Miss Martha. When you come to her door, she told you where to sit, told you what to do. She is in control. When he got to the house, he greeted him. Master, we're happy. I'm making the best meal you're ever going to eat. Have a seat right there. As long as you're the host, that's where he sits. That's where he sits. You forget the fact that as long as he's the host and he's the guest, you're the boss. You are the boss. Finally, she got a little weary of seeing Mary sitting in there talking, communing, fellowshipping. He comes to the door and she's angry. Attitude's not good. He says, Jesus, don't you see I'm sweating and working in this kitchen and Mary is doing nothing. That's just exactly where you're wrong, friend, when you take time for meditation and worship and prayer in your private life. That's not wasted time. That's good time. I can go in my study. I can pray, I can meditate, I can have the Word of God, but I can't come out and show you a thing I've done. Say, what are you doing? You're just reading. Yeah, the good old book. You're just talking. Yeah, to my Master, to my Lord. You're just sitting there thinking, yes, I'm meditating upon Him, my mind's upon Him, my heart's upon Him, I'm singing to Him, I'm worshiping Him. But I can't show you one thing that you'll count valuable enough to say, you you put in a good day today. I can't bring home a paycheck and say, here's what I made. i tell you what, what fellowship divine, what peace is mine, the joy of knowing Jesus Christ. There's going to be many meals served that you'll soon forget, but you'll never forget sitting at His feet. You'll never forget hearing His voice. You'll never forget His comforting words. You'll never forget His instructions. When you hear the voice of God, you cannot be the same person. Oh, I'm praying that we'll see apostolic times in a way that every young person will feel and receive a dynamic encounter with Jesus Christ. Oh, that will move on you with power that you know it's Jesus in you having a fellowship. Martha, Martha, you're so cumbered. I want to tell you right now, we're all a cumbered. It takes more of a man to pastor a church today than any time in our history. I don't want to enumerate all the things that's involved trying to pastor a church. But I'm telling you, preacher, none of our involvement is as important to him as those hours that you're not involved with the thing, but you're involved with him. There's no way out of this. You can say, I pray 14 hours a day. You learn anything? As long as you're praying 
you're not learning. I said, oh, I thought if I pray, I'd get real spiritual. Prayer is your voice to God. Is it important? Yes. But it's a time for you to shut up and let him talk back to you. How does he talk back to you? The Bible said, Jesus said, my word. If you can take the Sermon on the Mount and digest that, you've got her made, brother. Everything you need to know is in that Sermon on the Mount. Uh, every Christian should read the Sermon on the Mount and begin to digest it. But when he speaks to you and gives you the spirit and power and the strength that you need, I want you to know that's the best day of your life. But you've got to spend time listening to his voice. I'm a strong believer in meditation. The psalmist said, in the meditation of my heart, be acceptable in thy sight. Your mind wanders here and yonder. If your flesh controls it, it's back on some kind of wickedness or sin or temptation or lust or some sort. Your, your emotions are governed by how your mind flows. But I get my mind renewed every day, Lord. Renew my mind. Renew my spirit. I want to think about the thing that's godly, righteous, and soberly. Oh, God, help my mind. I want my mind stayed on Jesus. Young people... You can learn to walk and talk with Jesus Christ. Meditation means meditating upon Him. Take that word with you when you go to pray. And then as you're, as you're reading the book, don't try to read 14 chapters. Digest whatever it gives a quicken to your heart. When you read something, it begins to burn like fire in your bones. Stop there a while. Meditate upon that. Think about these things. They said the word sila means pause and think about that. In other words... We sing the song so fast, we don't know what we said. But the Lord said, when you sing my song, stop every once in a while and just think about what you just got through talking about and what you got through singing. Let your meditation be on my mind, be on, on the Lord constantly. You're going to learn how to have strength and power. This idea we get all bogged down in self-esteem, we ought to get God-esteemed. If you get in love with Jesus Christ, uh, He'll help your self-esteem. He'll help your confidence. Uh, he'll help you to learn how to not be afraid. He'll put boldness in your spirit. Because if you know Him, you've got the all wisdom, all knowledge, all understanding to call upon. You've got an inside track, friend. Young people, come on. Let's go to the inner chambers. Let the Holy Ghost touch us. Uh, come on, worship Him right now with me. Give Him some praise. Worship and praise. Time is getting away from me. You can be seated. Let me bring us to a conclusion. I'm got the whole day, but you want some too. Now, I want to talk about barn builders for a while. Man can only build a barn. And what's barns for? Put the livestock in. You put stubborn mules in there. You put greedy hogs in there. Proud peacocks go in there. And you store the hoods that you produced. If you produce lust, you've got piles of it sitting up inside your barn. That's the fruit of your wicked mind and your wicked lust. What kind of inventory does your barn have that it is a whole? Does every evil mind and every lustful thought grind through your head until you get to the place you feel like that you're living, as it were, in a private sanctum of your thinking? I'm telling you, young people, till your mind gets right, till your mind gets right, till your mind gets right, you'll never be able to leave lusting ideas. Man or woman. That's the strongest urge in humanity. The devil has painted it, fouled it, smeared it, contaminated it until... This world that we're living in is a cesspool. He says, I've got plenty of goods laid up for many years. Oh yeah, OJ, you've got plenty, haven't you? 
You can buy the best lawyers, can't you? But there's a judge of heaven that won't be bypassed. I want you to know a day of judgment will come. And the judge of all the ages, he will come. And he said, no transgression, no disobedience will pass his scrutiny. But what will receive a just recompense of reward. I'm here to tell you the barns are going to come down one of these days. You're going to find out that barn is empty. I've seen these people that have gone out lustfully and doping and drinking so they burn all their senses out of their system. No more does sin have any more pleasure to them. And they're saying life is not worth living. I can't get any more out of it. I've drained it all out of us, my system. My barn is full of flesh, full of self, full of the world. But I'm empty, miserable, restless. Get to the lake, won't solve it. Vacation won't fix it. I'm here to tell you there's no place that you can rest the body that'll take care of resting the spirit. It's a different kind of experience when you get a rest in the spirit and a rest in the body. And I'm here to tell you, young people, the barns are so stuffed full of junk today that you can hardly put anything else inside. What kind of pictures are in the barn? They're pornography. They're lustful. They're greedy stock market readings. It's a sport world with all the figures of who's who. It's full. That's a barn. That's what people are building today. I want to tell you something. You'll never make a barn a church. Tear the barn down. Burn up the fruits of, the, of your own labors. Do you notice how many times he said, I, I, mine. Then he said, so. That's not sure, sir. The rent collector's at the door. He's knocking. Who could that be at this late hour? I just balanced the books and okayed the plans. I've got it all fixed. So, why don't you... Can't you just relax now and enjoy it? You can't satisfy your spiritual nature with anything that's in this world. I'm here to tell you we don't need to put a lot of things aside for some day to enjoy or part of our toys. We've got more toys than we need now. It knows your imagination to have everything like the real thing. It's better when I was a kid, didn't have any money to buy the real things. We carved them out of little sticks and woods and pretended that they were. And they were the best ones I've ever seen. They never broke down. If they did, I just fixed them in my mind and they was all right going again. Imagination. You're that much like God. That old TV takes your imagination away from you. You know something? <clears throat> You'll discover that the imagination of the mind is what God gave you. He didn't give any other creature. When you're listening, your mind is forming pictures of what I'm talking about. It's forming thoughts that relates to what I'm saying. Your mind is working. Your imagination is, is comprehending it. And then when you, when you see something, uh, for instance, I'm, I'm reading the book. Now, I can read it to you, and your mind will imagine what it means. I can read it silently, and my mind goes to working. So immediately, if I'm reading, or if I'm being taught, it requires my imagination. But if you've got a TV, it numbs all of that. You're just an airhead. A numbskull. Empty. You're just a weak little worm sitting there, lollygagging at those folks making merchandise of your mind. You don't want, you wonder sometimes, why can't I make it in life? Because you've been living in the barn too long. It's time to come on to the Father's house and get in here. Let's find God's house. The barn does not produce any kind of life that you can enjoy. No barn does. Amen. And I've been, I've been to quite a few barn sales in the Spirit. I saw them sell out. I saw a young man that he walked down to the altar. 
He had his barn full of junk. I don't want to go back and name all the stuff. You know what I'm talking about. But I saw him one day. We had a barn burning at an old-fashioned altar. He repented of his sins. He put everything he had on the altar. Bless your heart. We had a bonfire burning the old lust, the old flesh. And now I got him. He, he's building a house now. God's building a temple. I put worship inside of there. But my problem as a pastor is ever so often I've got to go back and visit the house and see how, you, how well you're keeping the house. Uh, is everything looking all right around here? I'm coming for an inspection. You see, when the Holy Ghost comes to inspect your mind, your thinking, your feelings, your emotions, I tell you what, when He gets to looking over the house, uh, if you've got any sense at all, you say, Oh God, I've got to do some more work down here. I've got to be back at the altar again. It's time we realize that we'll never leave that altar. We'll never leave that altar. You and I must ride that altar rail, throw in the glory. We can't stop. We've got to keep learning, keep walking, keep serving, and let the Holy Ghost reveal to you the glory and the beauty of a Holy Ghost house. Oh, hallelujah. Every time the Word of God preached, it's like the inspector from the city hall coming out and looking at the work you've been doing. He looks at this and looks at the other. He puts the red tag on this and the red tag on that. He said, this is okay here. This is not okay over here. I want you to know, every time I come to hear the Word of God, I say, Lord, red tag anything that doesn't belong in this house. Uh, Red tag it all. i got to find a place for you to feel comfortable in my house. I wouldn't take nothing for that Word of God. Preacher, preach to me. If I get mad, don't quit. If I get upset, pray for me, but don't quit. Preacher, preach me the Word. That's what's going to save me. It's the Word. It's the Word. It's the Word. His Word will save us from all sin and all unrighteousness. That's His house. The prodigal said, I'm tired of living in this house. Well, what are you tired of? The beds are clean. The house is clean. Food on the table. Nice home. I tell you why he felt uncomfortable in that kind of house. He had a self-will inside of him. Young people, I don't care how, old, how young you are right now, you had better learn how to take correction. You better learn how when mom and dad says no, you stop your fussing and arguing. You've got to learn how to respect your elders, how to respect the pastor, how to respect others. You better learn that now because the world will teach you the hard way. Many young people have left us. And they just come back a few months ago. Three little kids, three different men. Wasted life. But God finally spoke to her. He cleaned her house out. Got the fellow out. Got back to the house of God. He taken care of those three little kids. He got right and prayed through. He's made up her mind. She's got to go to school to better herself. Now she's taking care of three kids, going to school, determined that I will make it. She told Brother Brown, Brother Brown, you were right when you told me to get out of the church when I was here. I was doing things in the church that shouldn't be done. I was influencing young people that shouldn't be influenced the way I was living. I want you to know I thank you for that. I've come back home now. i come back home. Preach the Word, Brother Brown. Preach the Word to me. I want to be saved now. i got a string of heartaches behind me. i got a string of... Shameful past behind me. But oh, thank God, I'm back at the dad's house now. I'm back at home. Oh, let's praise it for the house of God. Lord, it's your house. It's your house. When that boy, you see, give me, give me. Now, I don't believe you should have a car until you can pay for it. And by the insurance. I'm sorry. And you shouldn't have a new one to start with. You need an old rattle trap you've got to fix up. The reason I'm saying that, young people, is this. Everything given to you won't cost you nothing. And you can spend it the same way. But if it costs you something, you'll value that. And I'm here to tell you. 
you better buy gold that's tried in the fire. It's going to cost you something to be Pentecostal. It's going to cost you something. But let me tell you something. It's going to cost you more if you don't live it. It'll cost you more if you don't live for God. And that particle went on his eye wills. Now, I can't say it's strong enough, and somehow I'm going to come back to it again. From the smallest to the oldest. I don't care, you may be 50 years old, you still respect your mom and dad. Now, I'm going to say it stronger to you. Young people, you may need to go back home and tell mom and dad, I'm sorry for the way I've been acting. My attitude. You say, well, I spoke in tongues last night. That don't take, that don't take away from the fact you, don't, you owe them an apology. You go back. If you spoke in tongues, it ought to make you go back quicker and get it straightened out. You go back home and tell mom and dad, I'm glad I got a good house to live in. Hug their necks and tell them, I'm so glad I'm in your house. And when you go back to your church, look it over now. Quit complaining about little things in the place that you didn't like. Go back and tell the pastor and tell the saints, I thank God for my church. I thank God for you saints out here. This is my house. It's my home. We're going to appreciate what God's given us. When that young man had gone and spent all that was given to him, I'm here to tell you if you received the Holy Ghost somewhere in your past and you spent all that experience and wasted it out here on righteous living, I want you to know that a still small voice, a little preacher inside of your head called your conscience. And every so often it'll stand up in the middle of the night when you're in a stupor and it'll start preaching to you. You know you're a fool to be here. You know you shouldn't be in this condition. You've got a good home to go to. You've got a good church to go to. And here you are in a hog pen. I will build hog pens. I will build hog pens. And you eat slop. And we're tired of your slop. I don't like that attitude. I don't like that sneer. Slamming the door. Running off down the street. Getting the idea you're going to leave home. Let me tell you, friend, you're going to find out. When you do all those things, it's just as far back as it was when you went. You better be sure you do want to go, because you may never get back. But that hog pen, let's try to decorate it. It's a hog pen. But let's put some clean pictures on the wall. Their noses stood up there and smear it. Let's try to clean it up. Let's move it over here on clean ground. It'll only last one day. Because there are hogs here. And they got the smell. You can't put enough perfume to get rid of a hog smell. You can't put enough of anything to hide the odor of a hypocrite. Ah, uh, thanks. Of a backslider. And that old boy began to realize, I've been smelling flopping until I'm tired of it. I never did smell that at home. Mom always had a clean sheet in the bed and she had the house clean and there's a little perfume around there. Pictures on the wall. And I've been looking at hogs. When I hear some people that comes back out of the world and tell me what filth, I mean absolute filth, they lived in. I wondered, where was your head? Why did you do it? Most of the time, they didn't know any better. But I can't see a backslider going back to that. If you're hearing a backslider, I want you to know you're on board time. So by the time you get out of your hog pen, make up your mind you won't get a bath till you get back home. Go back to your church, tell your pastor, I'm sorry. I need a Holy Ghost baptism of repentance. And get myself cleaned up. And get on a clean garment. And be able to meet with the saints of God and express to them, I'm so happy that you folks didn't backslide, so I've got a home to come back to. I'm glad you still got the same old standards, the same old message, the same old gospel. I've come back home, and I wanted to be home back here. i got one more point to cover, and that's a church that's made into a barn. That Laodicean church 
was a barn. The Bible said we're increased with goods. And I'm here to tell you, when pride gets in your heart to build your church, to be better and more beautiful and more better, greater, whatever, than others, you've got the wrong attitude. God will accept worshiping in the most humble building. But if you're filling your church with things, if we've got to keep doing all the special kind of little parties to keep you in the church, that's not enough. We'll have a good time. But I want you to know, the house of God's going to be worship. The house of God's going to be living right. You're going to be clean. You're going to be godly. You're going to be holy. You can't play with God. You've got to come in with a whole heart. A backslidden church. A backslidden church is the worst building in the world. Is to see a church that once knew God. They sung the songs of Zion. They dressed right. They looked right. They act right. Revival was there. Then you walk back in and see the world everywhere. You see Jezebel's every place. You see Ahab's everywhere. I'm here to tell you, that's not my home. I put the backslider. I wouldn't go back to that kind of place. I wouldn't live in that kind of a church. I'd get out of that place. I'd take my family somewhere where the Holy Ghost is moving and the Holy Ghost is poured out and the name of the Lord is exalted and there's clean, holy living going on. We need to build a church, not a barn. Too many churches drift back to their old natures. Preacher, God won't deal with us the same as He does with saints. He'll deal more severe with preachers than anybody else. Moses, you just lost your temper one time, but you're not going in. Lord, there's a million out there that have done the same. Say, yeah, they've done worse. But you don't get away once. Preacher, the moment you back up on the message, you mislead that church. When you get to hell, they're going to look you up and hound you. Said you let down the message. We're both in hell now. We're here forever. Don't play this idea that hell's not real. There's folks there right now that was living yesterday. There's folks right now of your family, of your relatives that's in hell right now. If they get out of hell, they'd tell you, don't come here. Hell doesn't want you. I'm just trying to get across to you something and leaving you with this message today. Young people, your life is young. He's going to build your house. But you've got to get rid of I wills and say His will. God bless you. The next day, John saw Jesus coming toward him and said, Behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. Baptism, then what? Baptism is a burial in water for accountable beings into the remission of sins, for salvation to get into Christ, to become a new creature, to get into the one body. Then, walk in the new life, study and grow, become a servant of righteousness, keep self pure, be an example, have faith in God, follow Jesus, put first things first, Resist temptation, be faithful, and be fruitful.